Well, Richard, go a question. He said, what is the purpose of fighter aircraft? And people up to that point had given answers like the job of fighter aircraft was to fly fast or to turn quickly or to create or do whatever. Uh, Colonel Boyd came up with a different answer. He said the job of fighter aircraft is to do better than the other guy in a competitive situation. Okay, to survive in a competitive situation where the other guy doesn't. Having figured that out, he then uh, studied uh, dogfights and went from there to reanalyze the entire history of war from the beginning. Uh, beginning of recorded history in light of how do you survive in a competitive environment, how do you do better than the other guy in a conflict situation. He's worked out this briefing, which uh, is the most valuable classroom experience I personally have ever had. I can say that I learned more from eight hours with Colonel John Boyd about political science than I did in four and a half years at Washington and Lee. And, uh, Two or three times for it. So it's a, a very, very valuable presentation. Mr. Colonel Boyd's presentation is in demand for two reasons. First of all, he's been pushing it on the American defense establishment to get them to ask themselves the question before they build an army or a weapon or whatever uh, how are we going to succeed in a competitive environment? What is this thing going to do? And secondly, he's been in demand outside the defense community from people who find themselves in competitive environments who also want to figure out how to organize themselves to survive while the other guy does not. And it's in that context that we've invited Colonel Boyd to uh, uh, speak to us today, and this is Colonel John Boyd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I like to, I want to point out that Bob pointed out, which is a very important point, is the fact that uh, this is not called patterns of war. It's not called patterns of maneuver. You see very often the press tells people to try to do aggressively I think what we understand is that it's One other thing before I get into the presentation, I would like to make some comments. First of all, as I've already indicated, there's a large historical uh, aspect of Large, large historical content here. It's not that I wanted to look at uh, the military per se in a very, uh, very strict sense. What I would want to use it for is conflict in that environment is very sharp and you can bring out some very nice nuances and bring out subtleties. There's a large body of information and experience there to draw. A couple other comments I'd like to make. Now, you'll notice, you already noticed my title, the other comment I'd like to make is that. This isn't a recipe or a formula or the way to think about conflict. It is a way. I can't emphasize that enough. If you want to get your way as rich as possible, fill up a repertoire with as wide a repertoire as you can. Now, that'll become evident or manifest when you look at the presentation. And the other point is, as I work my way through the presentation, you'll notice that I might discuss some aspect or some phenomenon in a certain way. And then later on, I'll discuss very similar phenomena, but in different ways. In other words, you get a different image. Let me illustrate and show you what I'm getting at. Let's assume that we in this room went through all our life. We only saw pyramids in the first time. No other experience with pyramids. Well, we go through life thinking pyramids are trying to do that with your image or impression that we've had one time. Now, let's take another group, for example. Let's assume that they saw all the air light. I think it's a triangle, excuse me, a rectangle with intersecting diagonals. Then let's say this group got to interact with the other group, you both think the other one was crazy. If you'd be thinking about triangles, they'd be thinking about squares. Get your problem. You'll see why I've worked my way through the presentation. I work up some phenomena from different vantage points, and you get quite a bit of things. The key idea is you want to be able to see it from the top, from the side, or light angle from the inside, then you'll get a rich view of what Using that as a rather oversimplistic example, in some ways you'll see that we'll be going through this presentation. So you don't come up with what I call the so called elegant or definitive solution. There are no elegant, there are no definitive solutions. Other circumstances, other circumstances. Other circumstances. And I think our university system, our intellectual community, in some ways has done a disservice to us by always talking about the so called definitive solution. In fact, it really turns me off when I read a book and I see the definitive solution. 
But then you find out a year later it didn't work. Well, if it didn't work, then how could it have been so expensive? And so I think all you really want is something workable to use under the circumstances. One more comment before I go into the guidance the presentation here. You'll also notice as we work our way through the presentation that I'll be taking holes and breaking them down to bits and pieces. And then I'll take bits and pieces and reconstruct holes. And so you'll see as we're working our way through the presentation, I'm throwing things apart, putting them back together, throwing things apart, putting them back together. In other words, an alternative sequencing, analysis, and synthesis, whereby we're trying to get a richer and richer picture. So we're not only trying to understand what's going on, but we're also trying to evolve a pattern or a framework or an image that might be different. different. With that enough said, let's get into the uh, <laughs> work our way through the presentation. Now, here's the outline of the presentation. Incidentally, before I get into it, I will be leaving a hard copy of that presentation I have here. My hard copy. So if you people don't want to take the notes or things, I'll be leaving a hard copy. Here's the outline of the presentation. Point of departure, and as Bob has already indicated, point of departure, we start out here to air combat. There are certain things that we saw there. I was very deeply involved in the evolution design of the F-15 lightweight fighter. And when we went through that process, of course, at that time, we were the first time where we did it on high-speed computers to get rid of the design. At that time, we had the so-called edge of technology called IBM 7094 and IBM They're relevant. Well, typically what happens when you go through such a process, people tend, tend to get what I call those arrogant, confident people, they hate to look at things, maybe more vantage points than I did before. And so you tend not to worry too much about the test. But ultimately, you got to submit it to the world. And typically what happens is, you know, some things are right, and some things don't work out. So then what the community likes to do, then they say, well, those are just anomalies. Of course, then you sweep it under the rug because after all, you've got a schedule and a program. You don't want to, you don't want to interrupt this cash flow. You don't want to interrupt the program. It's not supposed to go on. But it's been my experience when you do something like this. These anomalies have a habit of getting what I call fame. They get very troublesome later on. And many of you people see yeah, Many of you people see the footage. Later on, they get wiped out. They just don't pay attention. You didn't see these anomalies. You better pay attention. Even if you don't understand them. And that was one of the reasons people didn't understand them. Have to go away because that nobody else understood. But eventually, people do get understood. And then you have very serious questions. So that's what happened. The result of that, then, why, of course, this helped get it threw me into what I call historical investigation. Now, the most term I use here is historical snapshot. <laughs> why, no matter how much history you read, there's always five and one. So you can only look at a certain snapshot form, and put it together, and read it. And we've already indicated it's the longest course of my presentation. Once again, remember I'm going through the sequence of analysis and synthesis to try to not only understand what's happening, but develop a new image or another impression to which we can teach what I like to call the lens to the situation, different lens that we had before. As a result of that process, we can evolve and develop what I call categories of products. Hypostatic, very dynamic categories. And I'll show you in the next chart what those categories are. And some of them you've seen in the newspaper, but you don't even realize that they're coming. There's some very powerful images, relationships, and associates. And that's what I will do. That will come later on in the presentation. Remember, we're going to work our way forward. We're going to show you the pictures so we can see those categories. And then I go into what I call a super synthesis. In other words, I just grab all this stuff, try to get an overall super image or super synthesis of what's going on. So we get a real good lens to it. Now, that gives us a picture. In the next chart, I'll tell you those key things that we're looking for to be in that. Now, as a result of that, in effect, we do have a new lens. So then I go back to two different in instances, look at military history. So I've got a different kind of lens. Now I want to look at certain events where certain phenomena took place. Guess what? If you look at the world with one kind of a lens, you get one kind of an image. If you look at the world with a different kind of lens, you get a different kind of image. And so you see, by looking at the same phenomenon, you can draw up different interpretations or different idea of what occurred. Because remember, we're a prisoner of our own images, our own filters. Our own views in our mind, we tend to see things. We'll look through things. So we'll do that. Then what I do after we look at that, I wonder what I call a 
supercondensation, right? Right, chart. In other words, they just squeeze you everything down. Like, what are those things we really put up in that? Show you that. Of course, at this point, you say, why don't we throw Boyd out of here and just sort of wrap up this thing and save this whole thing? I'm going to leave the page. That's the normal way. But unfortunately, if we did that and I showed you the round of the first, we wouldn't have much meaning to it. But remember, the meaning was built up by going through this. And you're looking at it from a different frame of reference. You see those words, you say, you don't understand anything. You say, what is all that? So we've got to build up. In other words, that's the right passage right here to see. You'll see that. Then you have to go through it. You say, yeah, these are very significant. These are the kind of things you have to pay attention to. At least if you're going to have this sort of impression to which you're going to view the world of consciousness. Now, you'll notice I have another term down here called epilogue. Well, as I went through the presentation, a little bit unsettled because unconsciously or consciously or in a sort of a subdued sense I was juxtapositioning the ideas that I was struggling out versus the so-called crystal core what you know ground in stone so what I'm gonna do in the epilogue I'm gonna take on you'll notice as I work my way through I'll have some rather sharp comments about the principle We'll see why next week we're going to do this. Cause me to put it back in the room. Go ahead. Well, you might tell us what, are you going to tell us what the principle is? Oh, yeah, okay, I'll show you what the principle is. And what you're going to find out, the problem is there is no one set of principles. Different countries have different principles. So that, that right there should tell you something. And then some countries don't even have them. And they're not necessarily not successful ones. Yet we have this August body in this country, you know, the, the high priests don't want to let those principles work up. Remember, you don't want to be a mastodon. There are no mastodons left on the earth, at least we don't think so. Of course, some of you people say, well, we still got a few in some of our parties, but nevertheless, <laughs> we have some old pentagons too. But I'm, I'm trying to point that out. You don't want to hold on things too tightly so you can't see the world through a different end. That doesn't mean you want to follow the traditions out either. Now, the sources I won't pretty far. So, with that in mind, let's start talking to our presentation. Now, this is what I call a focus and direction presentation. I'm going to give you a little quick overview of what we're doing. And the actual immediate mission is what I want to do. One, what we want to do is what I call make manifest and make evidence. This aspect of conflict, the moral, mental, and physical. In other words, you can think of these three categories of conflict moral, mental, this is what talk about three categories. Now, many people have heard Napoleon's famous statement the moral is the physical, the moral is the material, and it's three to one. So, whether it was three to one or ten to one or not, that's not the point he's trying to make. He said, more important than the physical aspect, you can draw a great deal, great deal more leverage out of it by doing What we want to do, we see that nice statement, we want to put pressure on that. What are we really talking about when we're talking about we have moral strength, we have moral authority, we have moral value, how are we going to use those in conduct? Get that moral liberty. We're going to put pressure on it. We're going to work our way through that. We're going to work our way through the presentation. Now, as it turns out, as we start mid air combat, we'll be primarily starting on the mental side. Fighter pilots, one working against the other, is very much of a mental game. And then, as we start looking back in military history, we'll pick up the physical early military history. And then we'll start weaving them together. Start letting one interact with the other. Then we get back to categories of conflict. We're going to go specifically to look at those kinds of things and draw out like to think of as a rather important feature. We really want to think of. The next point, you know what I'm referring to here, or we call it false, I think it's called it in Pattern for successful operation. What I'm referring to here is if we're going to be in a competitive or a conflict or an adversary relationship here, what are those kinds of things that we can do to gain leverage over our adversary? Or likewise, deprive him or deny him leverage against us. So, of course, that word leverage is nice. What do we, what do we mean by leverage? We'll have to become evidence to go through the presentation. I don't know what we mean by leverage, but those things that give you that leverage against somebody or those things you can do in order to minimize or diminish somebody's leverage against you. We want to understand. Now, that's going to come out. In fact, these three things are going to show up in the, in the synthesis. Patterns of successful operation. Let's build up so we can actually lay that down. Those kinds of things are important. Note the third book. 
the idea of trying to generalize tactics and strategies. Now, as we work our way through here, you're going to see different tactics, you're going to see different strategies. And you can lay out but any number of tactics and strategies for a particular situation. But you'd like to think you could subsume them under more general notions. It turns out you can't. What are those general notions in which you can subsume those specific tactics, strategies, etc., under that? And you'll see that we can come up with something like this. And we can use it. But before we go into the presentation, I'd like to just make a couple comments. First of all, when we're speaking to tactics and strategy, or when we're discussing it, what I and you think about it in terms of what I call means and ends. And you think of tactics as a execution, activity, dynamics directed towards some end, the end being an aim, a goal, objective, whatever it might be. So in that sense, the tactics is a means towards some end. The means being action of some kind or another. On the other hand, if you think of strategy, you think in terms of means and ends too. Strategy being the design, the architecture, the scheme, the plan, etc., also directed towards some end. Once again, aim, goal, objective, whatever it might be. Or another way to think, you think of the tactics as being a means for the strategic end. You don't want to get any type of speed clues because you start closing too down too much those definitions, then you exclude possibility. That's one thing you don't want to do in conflict. You want to be able to entertain many possibilities. If you have more than your adversary, you can blame that animal, and he doesn't know what to do. Painting, chaos, confusion, and disorder, and stuff. Start coming to blue. So you don't want the definitive rally of solution. If the other guy understands what that is, he's going to be able to leverage you. And as you'll see, in that sense, variety is very important, particularly being a wider variety than your adversary in order to deal with. Because that's very important in that context. And that's why you don't want to limit yourself to these definitions. Once again, the key idea here is to come up with sort of some general impression, general view of tactics and strategies. In other words, you can assume the other notions of it. And then finally, final ball here, the idea we call a basis for grand strategy. Now, for the most part, these first three bullets here is what I call destructive behavior, pulling the guy apart or can't cope, trying to gain leverage over him. You're trying to put him in a confusion, disorder, whatever it may be, so he can't cope. You would like to think that should lead to some kind of constructive end or constructive behavior. And in this sense, I tend to use a grand strategy as a connecting link between my destructive behavior on one hand and my constructive behavior on the other. It doesn't mean you have to do it that way. It's sort of a fallout, just by the way, I want to do my investigation. And that will become evidence we work our way through. And then finally, my intent, you know, why are we doing all this? Very simple. When you really understand nature of conflict, survival of conflict. Now, when I'm talking about survival of conflict, I'm not really talking about you trying to take the club and beat your adversary over the head. I'm talking about it can be very soft, it can be intermediate, or it can be very sharp. So it's not just physical, it's more on that as well. You can cope with competitive pressure, but you can deal with that environment. It's going to be a lead. Okay, so that's sort of the character of the presentation. With that in mind, then let's go to our First point or outline, point of departure here. As I've already indicated, I was very deeply involved in the evolution design of the F 15s and lightweight fighters. As I also have already indicated, we have some problems there. And the key thing is, even though we have all this theory, eventually we have to face up to the real world of tests. We came up with certain anomalies. We explain those anomalies for some time. So I'm just going to give you some insight. One of the, what, what you'll think is a very trivial statement, but at the time was not in your investigation. So out of that activity, we came up with this sort of a generalization in a related statement. The fact we needed a fight, and I'll explain these terms in a minute, that can both lose energy and gain energy more quickly while turning an energy. So before we can deal with that statement, what do I mean by energy? Energy we think of in the sense that I'm using mechanical energy, the sum of your potential and your kinetic energy. Potential being L2, kinetic being air. The point being, is if I'm going to maneuver someone and I'm going to gain energy, I either have to gain altitude, airspeed, or some combination thereof. If I'm going to lose energy, I'm going to have to lose altitude, airspeed, or some combination thereof. And the reason why we use energy is because it shows you the relationship between these two kinds of things, or two kinds of things that you would describe as altitude and airspeed. That's why it's very convenient, very useful in that sense. You say, well, my God, that's just a trivial state. Well, a few years ago, it was. Because the general perception then was you want to gain or conserve energy while trying to outturn it. That doesn't say conserve. 
you might want to pump it out at an extraordinary amount, probably maybe not long time, in order to make it live. And I remember very vividly when I grilled some of the fighter pilots when we ran these tests for lightweight fighters against other adversaries. This one pilot said, I really didn't want to lose that energy. I was trying to do something else, but I still want it. I said, well, then it had value when you pumped it up. So even they were tending to fight. I said, you really want to reflect upon it when you lost it. A desirable result, in other words, come out on top. And you gave it. So it even took some time for people who were so-called experts in fighter combat to gain a feel for the acceptance of that idea that very often happened. So that was one of the things that we found that out. And of course, that's the thing that you'll see has led me into, drove me to the whole pattern of conflict we're getting into right now. In other words, the pilots also said other kinds. They said, in other words, they said what they really wanted was an airplane whereby they could dominate the circumstances of engagement. In other words, they could pick the engagement officer to make those ready. Because they could tell a designer that he doesn't know something about They think it's just this design. But they go on, they become more specific. They say, in a sense, they want a fighter wherein they can either force an overshoot by an attacker or stay inside a hard turning defense. So let me explain to you what I mean by overshoot. Let me use my hands to fighter problem. If I'm going to make an attack upon something, the guy bends the airplane very hard, then I'm forced to overshoot his flight path and he can come in behind me and I'm in a bad position. Or contrary wise, if I'm on the defense, what I want to do is force the guy to overshoot my flight path so I slide in behind him and take him out. What we call sort of the classic maneuver. All you think you're doing is to kind of get in that position. So on the offensive, you don't want to be forcing the overshoot. On the defense, you deliberately want to get that overshoot. So if you think about that, the, we see the spatial relationship. In some sense, in, in a very general sense, you want to force your adversary in a wider maneuver space than you are so you can get inside. In other words, you want to get inside his maneuver space so you can gain leverage on him. In this specific instance, we're going to generalize it. Now, as it turns out, in order to make those hard maneuvers, it's not an easy maneuver may be easy, but then the drag goes up enormously above the thrust of the engine. When drag goes up above thrust, you either have to go down to airspeed or some combination thereof. And you bend those airplanes so hard, build the drag up so high, you literally go down almost like a Otis elevator, just lose energy very quickly and spiral yourself right to the ground. Well, the pilot's not going to do that. For one thing. And the other thing is, remember, it's not just a dual one-on-one. -on -one. There's other people working in the weeds up there. And so when you're trying to work against somebody, somebody else will try to blindside you and take you out. So the point is, you don't want to be engaged too long with anybody. You want to get in, do the job, get out, get in, do the job, get out, because when you're working on somebody, somebody may be working on you. In other words, it's not healthy. You get what we call tunnel vision. You keep your eyes on one guy up here because somebody else is going to take you out. That's where the word comes from, tunnel vision. You've probably heard that term, quite a while ago. Don't get tunnel vision. You've got to stay alert all the time. So you don't want to get wrapped up too long. You want to get your feet your engagement short. Well, if you think about that, you're getting these very hard maneuvers that you're doing for very short intervals of time. So they're very jerky, they're very hoppy, they're very skippy. So you got a space problem, you got a time problem. Jerky maneuvers of time, space. We call that the transient. In other words, they're very fleeting. You know, notice underlying term, fast transient, double underlying. Trying to get inside our adversary maneuver space or deny him that same opportunity against us. And we're going to do this for a very short intervals of time so we don't get blindsided by somebody else. In other words, so in some sense, that gives a basis for controlling the engagement opportunity. And we call it advanced training. Now, if you think about that from when you say, that's a very specific situation, that's just for air to air combat. But then the idea begins to occur to you and say, well, geez, very sharp turning or poppy skip and jumping kind of things in life. It's useful maybe to other kinds of competitive behavior where a guy can't get an image or a picture of what's going on. In other words, can we generalize or can we expand upon an idea? And if we do, where does that go? That's exactly what we're going to do right now. So that's not me, but we expand upon an idea of mass training. So we begin to think about instead of treatment, a very specific instance, we want to generalize. Expand. In some sense, what we're saying then, in some way, we want to operate at a faster tempo or rhythm than our adversary. Expand it out. When I'm talking about physically, you'll see later on, morally, mentally, and physically. Right now, we'll show you sort of physical instances. But pin that down a bit. What we're really saying, is better yet, I tell you, what I really want to do is get inside my adversary's observation, orientation, decision, action, time cycle, or loop. We're going to show you later on time cycles or loops. 
Say again? Right. Exactly. We want to think things down. Got to get inside his mind. Look right inside. Right. But let's examine this. What are we really referring to? As individuals here, we have to observe what's going on out there. With our eyeballs, or get somebody else's observation, or we, in a warfare sense, modern electromechanical equipment, or if an intelligence business, eavesdropping equipment, etc. You're gathering all that information from all those different sources. You literally then pump that information into your brain. What happens then when you pump that information into your brain? You start generating images, views, impressions, etc. What I call orientation. That orient you to what's going on. You start putting it all together. You get an orientation. Out of that orientation, possibilities begin to suggest themselves. And you have to pick, choose, or as I say, decide here upon those possibilities. You can't do them all and just say, okay, I'm going to go for these or that. You make that decision. Then you have to implement that decision or take the action. Then you have to observe the consequences of that action, and you roll back through that loop. Not only the consequences of that action, you're also doing what? You're drawing in peripheral information at the same time. And you roll through that loop. Well, guess what? All human beings, we all do. Our adversary do we do. But no, when I said, we want to get inside his loop. In other words, we want to be able to roll through that at a faster tempo or a faster pace than he can. And why do we want to do this? Why do we say Because if we can do that, we will then begin to appear ambiguous or unpredictable to him. Not only that, we can generate confusion disorder in his system, our adversary system. Now, let's get a deeper sense of that why. After double <coughs> because if you can do that, he will be unable to generate those appropriate images or pictures that agree with that unfolding phenomenon. Both menacing and fascinating. No, nope, I got them both right. Menacing and fascinating. If it's not menacing, he didn't have to pay attention to it. But if I put a gun in his head, he's got to pay attention to it. Whether it be physical, moral, or mental. Now, when I'm talking about menacing, not to just kill him, as long as you can threaten something that's of value to him. That's of value to him. It all has to be of value. Whether it's position of pecking order, respect from his peers, or his life, whatever it may be. As long as it's value to him, he's got to play the game. That's the situation. So both menacing and passive. So basically, if you look at this double dash system, after the double dash, what am I really saying here? In some sense, what you're really trying to do is generate a mismatch between that which he perceives and that which he must react or adapt to. So therefore, if I can work my way through the loop faster than he can or get inside his loop, then we generate those mismatches. I'm going to give you a feel. Let me illustrate. Give you a feel. It's a very important point. Let's assume we in this room are going to go up and get some attitude. Or some other group of status, which you people that will be doing here. But, okay, now let's assume, for the sake of the academic argument, that we can operate that faster tempo or pace. In other words, we can get inside his loop. We, in fact, we call it O O D A. You'll hear that term, O O D A. So let's assume we can get inside his loop. What does that mean? If he goes to make a move, we adjust inside that move. So his move now is no longer relevant. He tries to re move. We adjust again, it's no longer relevant. Well, after, you know, after a couple of those, he's going to notice he's losing out. In other words, he's going further and further away from his goal. We're also going to notice we're going further and further closer to our goal. Well, if this is a competitive situation, he values what's going on. What's that going to do to him? Doubt and certainty is going to begin, begin to build up in his mind. And if we keep that pace on and don't take the pressure off, we transform that doubt and certainty into confusion and disorder. You've probably seen where people. When we press start coming out of the wound, it's a strange, bizarre thing. It makes it even worse, unless somebody takes a squeeze off. Now, if you have one group going against another group, and a group, that other group's losing out, whatever it means, then they start transmitting those doubts, fears, and uncertainties one to the other. So not only confusion, disorder, panic, and chaos come out. You can just see it well up there from panic, they're totally unmoved. can't function in an organic hole. Now that, they start pointing fingers at one another, because nobody wants to be a failure. That even helps even more. You've never seen that before, have you? <laughs> of course you can. You've heard the statement. Victory has a thousand fathers, defeat is north. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Nobody wants to take the point. 
So if you have groups going against one another, doubts and fears begin to well up and transform into panic chaos. No, still. So it's a very important idea. Trying to get inside his system. The idea being when you get inside is to generate mismatches between that which he must see. We can perceive that which he must see. Okay? So, do we have any examples? 